I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 311. It is... Uh, what day is it? It's either August 25th or August 26th of 2022, depending on when you listen to this. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about today. And as always, so many things, so much hot goss that we can't talk about (laughs) on this, the first and still the only wrestling podcast. So I, when we were discussing doing a show this week, I pitched calling this show the self-destruction of AEW. (laughs) Which is probably overstating things, given that they were first on cable by a pretty wide margin on Wednesday night this week. They ticked back up over a million viewers for CM Punk and John Moxley having a world title match. And yet, it feels to me in the last several months that the wheels are just coming off the cart. When it comes to AEW, there's a lot of gossip. There are a lot of um, a lot of things to get into there. We'll touch on WWE stuff later, although there really wasn't a ton from WWE in Toronto. Well, I guess there was some from WWE in Toronto this week. We got Edge threatening to retire. Don't threaten me. It's a good time. (laughs) Uh, My close personal friend your status was on the show mm-hmm. and uh johnny gargano came back so we'll get to the wwe stuff in quite a bit in a little bit here but first really we are gossip queens first and foremost <laughs> so much gossip coming out of aew so we 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 talked a little bit about cm punk um reverting to his his true form on last week's <laughs> show y- you you have coined this term for him the meanest man who ever lived Mm -hmm. (laughs) so on this week's show on this week's dynamite cm punk and john moxley had a world title unification match it lasted like four minutes it was a squash match john moxley squashed cm punk unified the world titles cm punk was carried off Still, still, somehow, apparently, they have a pay per view in 10 days with no main event announced. And apparently, Punk and Moxley are going to main event that show as well. I don't know how, but okay. Um, what did you think of uh, CO Punk and John Moxley on Dynamite this week? Yeah, it was fascinating. Um, I was, uh, as you'll hear a little bit later in the bonus features, I was at the Oriole game during, uh, during the live airing of Dynamite. So I was. I didn't know the exact details of it, but I knew Moxley had won, which kind of surprised me. So I got home. I watched the show before I went to bed last uh, on on Wednesday night. And when I saw what they did, I and then the follow up promo that John Moxley cut, I thought, well, Punk's going to be gone for like another three months now. <laughs> like maybe he's really like I thought, well, he must really not be 100 percent. And they just wanted to unify these belts and then he'll come back as the, you know, the taped up grizzled veteran in a few months with the, uh, you know, with, with the, the softening of this defeat being that he, he came back too soon and re-injured himself or whatever. Um, But then when you, you, when you throw in the nugget that apparently he's going to be main eventing all out in 11 days, (laughs) just makes no sense to me why you why you would do it and why you would do it in that way (laughs) it would be one thing if you had like a really wild chaotic brawl before the bell rang and you and you you the match gets thrown out before it even starts and moxley just destroys punk and lays him out and breaks his foot again or whatever but the fact that they did the match i mean john moxley did not cheat cm punk injured himself within the the story of the match and then Moxley hit him with his move and beat him. <laughs> so to me, if you're going to, this is kind of a twofold thing. One, I can't imagine doing a rematch 11 days later. Yes. But second of all, like in my opinion, and this is something WWE does this a lot, did this a lot over the years. It's not just an AEW thing, but 
My thing is always, if you are going to have a top guy beat another top guy in this dominant of fashion, that top guy who did got the win should not just lose back, lose it back to the, to the guy he just destroyed. Like probably at all, but at least the first loss shouldn't be to the guy he destroyed. Like theoretically, if you're doing this and John, John Moxley should be your guy for a year and then jungle boy or somebody should be beating him. And that's somebody that can get something out of getting a win over John Moxley, because if you just beat the guy savagely and then that guy comes back two weeks later and beats you, it doesn't feel like you're getting much out of it. If anything. Yeah, no argument, no argument whatsoever. I would go a step further and say that one, I don't think a, 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 an already established top guy should squash another top guy like that. And let like, like Moxley doesn't need that win that way. Moxley is as over as Moxley is going to be. And Moxley's bulletproof and he's protected and he doesn't lose a bunch. And was he really helped all that much with that? dominant victory i don't know but for sure cm punk is your biggest star and you just made him lose in four minutes it was a little bit of a fluky banana peel thing there's a story to tell there but he lost in your biggest star lost in a squash match why why would you ever do that i i'm it's it's beyond me and then come back and run it back 11 days later makes no sense to me right and like the 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 closest parallel i think to this is the cena brock thing in 2014 which was not originally supposed to be cena that was supposed to be brian danielson taking that pummeling but things happen cena ends up in that spot brock destroys him and wins the title and then they rematch three weeks later and have a more competitive match. And I think that was a mistake at the time because Brock was coming off of ending the streak and then destroying Cena. So again, theoretically, you're building him up at the time for Roman Reigns. And instead, you let Cena like start getting his heat back on Brock a few weeks later. So that feels like the closest parallel we have to this right now. Obviously, Moxley isn't really a a Brock type monster character who, you know, no sells guys offenses and kicks out of finishers at one and things like that. He's not really that type of character. So it's not really even a perfect comparison, even within this realm, but that's the closest one that I could think of. And yeah, to me, the thing is I would, I probably wouldn't have punk get his win back ever at this point, (laughs) but I certainly wouldn't do it before let's say November like if you if punk if I were doing this and this is what we're doing I would say okay punk needs to be off the show until like October and then he can come back on TV and win a couple of matches and get back in the rankings and earn one more shot at Moxley and then you do that at the November show but so again if at all I would have Moxley beat him again (laughs) in november based on what you've done now right but under no circumstances would i a book a rematch that quickly or b have punk win after (laughs) after what you did so it's quite the uh it's quite the interesting conundrum they've they've built for themselves well after dynamite this week is when things really started to get good As always, when the when the 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 now weekly, I guess, yeah, trickle of of scoops comes out from the tapings of the the arguments and 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 uh, behind the scenes maneuverings start to uh, start to leak out. Yeah, so I guess the Voices of Wrestling site did on their Dynamite post show this week. They uh, they broke some gossip, and they said that uh, Eddie Kingston was suspended from AEW for starting a fist fight with Sammy Guevara backstage. Now, in later retellings and in the official report of this, um, Eddie Kingston was quote-unquote secretly suspended, unquote. By the way, secret is something you tell one other person. (laughs) 
That's the definition. That's the definition of a secret. Mm-hmm. Uh, Eddie was Eddie was suspended. There was no fist fight. In Sammy Guevara's telling of retelling of the story, Eddie tried to pie face him, but but sort of ended up just lightly touching his face, which he said was weird. <laughs> which, <laughs> which I am not a Sammy Guevara guy, and that was an extremely funny way of putting it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but. So Eddie Kingston and Sammy Guevara, which they had started to build for the all out pay-per-view was just dropped without much of an explanation. Both guys disappear from TV, although there was no official word that Sammy was secretly suspended, just that Eddie was secretly suspended. Sammy did work a rampage between then and there, too. He and Ty did a mixed tag. Yes, they did. Um but Kingston and Guevara not liking each other and there being a bit of a verbal altercation backstage is the first big scoop that came out of this. And the fact that Eddie was quote unquote secretly suspended made me ask the question, well, has CM Punk been secretly suspended now <laughs> after uh, him, his, unprovoked verbal attack on hangman page on last week's episode of dynamite or is this just weird storytelling that they're doing could be yeah i i kind of lean towards more it's it's just the weird storytelling obviously it's not much of a suspension if he's going to be back in 11 days to mean event your pay-per-view and probably win like that's Agreed. not a it's not much of a punishment i mean again there are different rules mm-hmm. for bigger stars not just in the pro wrestling industry in every industry so you know that that could very well be what happened and they might they may have decided he needs to go home and cool off for a couple of weeks or there needs to be at least one or two dynamite shows or tapings where he is not in the same building as hangman or the elite or whoever his his current beefs and his his friends associated beefs are with (laughs) Um, because there's also the he he and uh, FDR are obviously very close and FDR was I don't know if we'd ever talked about that on the show but FDR publicly whined about the young bucks turning themselves baby face and losing the tag titles to somebody else uh, so there's there's like the punk FDR faction, and then there's the elite guys, which I guess Hangman would be included in that crew. And then there's, you know, there's the friends of Colt Cabana <laughs> contingent as well. Yes. Which I would assume extends beyond just the elite guys. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of moving parts. <laughs> yes, very much so. Uh, Eddie and Sammy. Uh, what? What do you think about that? If anything, I mean, it's believable because it's Eddie Kingston, right? Like, <laughs> he, this guy. Where does the working start and the care? Where does the guy start stop and where does the character start? I, don't yeah, know. There, I mean, yeah. There's a there's a clip from a he was doing uh, one of those live uh, high spot signings where it's yeah you know, they're just like handing him figures to sign and he's and they're just shooting the the s while he's talking and he specifically mentioned how like he hopes sammy's at tv this week because he's gonna go f him up or something like that like and again he was in the middle of a television feud with sammy and the rest of jericho's crew but um and there was i guess a tweet from a few months ago where eddie took exception to sammy posing with the tnt title in a suggestive way because he felt like that title represents Brody lee and that that's disrespectful or something. I don't like again, but Eddie Kingston, by his own admission, he did a, a tremendous article in the Players Tribune a couple months ago where he just talked about, you know, his his mental health issues and his, you know, his addiction issues. Like he is he is not a guy who will ever back down. Like the guy you see on TV is for the most part. It's one of the reasons that I think he's such a compelling and likable television character is because he feels like the realest guy on the show and you feel like when he is talking that that is eddie kingston talking and not 
you know, not a character talking when, when he's there, when, when he did the promo with punk last year and he called him, you know, a narcissist and a bully and yelled at him that nobody wanted him there and all this stuff. Like it felt like that was something that Eddie Kingston really felt and really believed. So yeah, it wasn't hard for me to believe that tensions ran high and Sammy Guevara is a young Again, I think there's a lot of his real life in in his television character too. Like, uh, and so I can see why those personalities could uh, could clash, and that could lead to raised tempers. It's a very intriguing situation, and I guess part of the voices of wrestling, or one of the follow up for reports or something on the Eddie and Sammy thing was that people are not exactly lining up to work with Sammy Guevara. <laughs> mm, well. So the fact that Eddie was w- was willing to work with Sammy, I don't know. And then Sammy's comments, like he, Sammy Guevara did an interview at some point during the day on Thursday that I have to do an article about it since we get off the <laughs> air here. Uh, so they're definitely turning this back into an angle or I, I don't know, man. I was going to say, Ed, Eddie also like went on the record with multiple wrestling reporters in the last 24 hours. Yeah. And just said, yes, this altercation happened. I was in the wrong. I apologize. And yeah. So, yeah. I mean, like I said, uh, what how what percentage of this was is, you know, when did it turn back into the work is is yes. probably going to be a fun timeline to put together maybe we maybe we'll find that out you know in a few months when one of them's on, one of them is on jericho's podcast or renee's podcast or somebody maybe we'll get like a timeline of events here but yeah yep. for now it was it seemed like it started out as a feud and then it got got real real <laughs> for uh for a little bit there and now we're heading back towards it becoming a, a television storyline again yes so, also on Dynamite this week, Thunder Rosa, vac- uh, she didn't vacate the women's championship. She announced, well, <laughs> you wouldn't necessarily know that based on her promo. In her promo, she said she was stepping down as women's champion, which is not not, not correct. They're making, they're making another interim championship. Um, and there's going to be an interim championship match at uh, All Out. Yeah, Thunder Rosa is injured she says she's injured she's -hmm. she's desperately injured the subtext of all of this is that no one has outright reported but a lot of people are hinting at this is a Shawn michaels she lost her smile situation Mm -hmm. and thunder rosa didn't want to do a job for tony storm at all out which was the likely finish and so she suddenly has come up with maybe bulging discs in her back. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So there's also a story <laughs> of Thunder Rosa. I can't, can't confirm this. Someone reported it. It was I think it was also on the Voices of Wrestling show. Correct. <laughs> Thunder Rosa wrestled uh, Jamie Hader at Battle of the Belts a few weeks back. Uh, Jamie Hader broke her nose in the match. The story goes, Hader was already upset with Rosa for be for like drop kicking her in the back of the head in a tag match they had earlier that week or the week prior, which was pretty brutal. I saw that gift today; like that was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Like she was just, she was breaking up a pin. Rosa was trying, Pater was pinning somebody. Rosa was trying to break up the pin. But instead of just like running into her, she like shoot drop kicked her in the back of the neck. <laughs> yeah. And Hater had no idea it was coming. I mean, she may have known she was going to get hit. She didn't know she was going to get drop kicked in the, in the vertebrae. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, Hater was already uh, irritated with Rosa for that, as the story goes. So then Rosa breaks Hater's nose <laughs> in in their match at Battle of the Belts. Rosa wins. 
And then the story goes, Rosa hid it in the bathroom in a, in a stall in the bathroom because she was afraid of Hater, who apparently has a bit of a rep as a shooter, <laughs> which is <laughs> which is pretty hilarious to me for some reason. <laughs> Uh, because she was afraid that Hater was going to mess her up after she had like hurt her twice in a week. A lot of people not a fan of Thunder Rosa backstage either at AEW, so it would seem. Mm -hmm. Which is so hmm? interesting to me, because it felt like if there was going to be a backstage heel emerging, like say six months ago, Sure. You would have thought that would have been Britt Baker, who is obviously publicly and very good friends with the boss and is the most pushed character on television and <laughs> tends to have a habit of and part of it is she's a she's a very good talker, right. but part of her shtick is usually she kind of goes out and buries people like on, on the microphone and and yeah, and especially like people and and most people and then she goes out and wins the matches that's that was kind of the thing it's like yes she buries people like ruby or sheeta or rosa and then she also beats them <laughs> with her move yeah and and so I, you would have thought maybe that that if there was an emerging you know click forming in the locker room and obviously i'm sure not every person every woman in the locker room or every person in, in aew hates slender rosa but sure. it sure felt like there was there was some sort of tide shift at some point, and now it's like, now it feels like Rosa is is maybe public enemy number one. Everything that you said about Brit is true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like last week, maybe they knew that they were gonna that Rosa wasn't gonna do a job last week. But anyway, last week on Rampage, Britt Baker got like three minutes, two, two or three minutes of promo time just talking about how she's not on the pay-per-view. <laughs> it's, like, mm -hmm. it's like their TV time, their real estate is so valuable. They have so many people and X amount of minutes to try to get all these people on, on television every week. But they deemed it important enough to give Britt Baker three minutes to talk about how she's not on the pay-per-view. Just to remind you that Britt Baker is the big, is the biggest star on the show. Mm -hmm. and it's like, look, I don't think Britt Baker means any ill will by any of this. I've I've heard mostly good things about Britt Baker. <laughs> <laughs> Not all, but I've heard mostly good things about Britt Baker. Sure. I don't get the impression that she is disliked, universally disliked backstage there. But yeah, so she, she's she's presented as the biggest star. Thunder Rosa was like this hybrid character coach kind of thing. And then made her the champ. And then people don't like her because one, she was telling people how to work, whether or not that's justified or not. She was kind of working with Dustin as a women's coach there. Anyway, this leads to a bunch of organizational changes that we can talk about here is they had, I guess, Tony Schiavone is acting like a talent relations liaison. Mm -hmm. Now they bring in Madison rain as the head women's coach. So Rosa and Dustin I don't know what they won't be working with the women anymore, but they won't be officially head coaching the women anymore. That job is now Madison Reigns. They've instituted a lot of uh, of structure there mm -hmm. and some layers between more buffers between Tony Khan and the talent. They had a talent meeting this week at television where Tony Schiavone spoke and played the good cop. The Young Bucks spoke and played the good cop. Jericho spoke, played the good cop. Kenny Omega spoke and played the bad cop. <laughs> Which 
You think he did his weird like anime villain promo voice when he? Yes. When he was doing it too. Yes. Yes, I do. And then Tony Khan had Meka, the their lawyer who also works for the Jaguars, uh, go on to a speech about quote unquote legal things, and also that she's he had instructed her to send off a strongly worded email to Nick Khan and Stephanie McMahon about contract ta- about tampering with AEW talent because I guess overtures had been made from WWE to more than one AEW talent about coming in in the new Triple H regime. Although, anyway, if all of this sounds like a mess, to me it is. <laughs> and uh, there's just... Not everything is sunshine and rainbows in that company. Mm-hmm. We've known this for a long time. And now it's just it's starting it's starting to come out. Yeah, you know, it was interesting. So when they originally announced these uh, structural changes with Shivani and Sanjay Dutt and whoever getting yeah. getting promoted and, and Madison Raiden coming in, uh, they did a podcast. Shivani, uh, the, the podcast he and Aubrey does. Yes. Where he just sort of explained what his role is now. Um, which I which I listened to part of, and he basically said, um, like he has certain roles as far as like he he has to uh, you know like he produces edits on Rampage and things like that that are were already kind of in his job structure. But as far as the talent relations side goes, it's like most of my job is if I'm not in a meeting or something is to go around to people and just say how you feeling, how you doing, mm-hmm. what do you like, how are you like that's that's his job now, and right. he, he made a point of saying that. For a long time, in many different companies, uh, people in wrestling have been treated by like S by the office. Right. And this is going to be a slow process. But he thinks that he said he's, he works directly with the, the EVPs and he's working with Pat Buck and Sanjay and he's working with Tony. And he said there's still more things that he personally would like to see change and uh, things that he thinks would help the the show continuity wise and things like that. But as far as the day to day structure and and making sure that people feel heard and feel like they have a sounding board and someone that they can talk to, that he is he's kind of meant to be that that sponge who is there to to hear people's questions and concerns and and to communicate the office's position of like, hey, we have this coming up for you, or hey, sorry, we don't really have much going on for you right now. Right. You know, if you know, if you have a pitch for us, let us know type of thing. So right. that, that's kind of he kind of went over like that in detail, which is good because if previously the solution was the only thing you really had to do was go knock on the buck store or knock on Tony's door. And now you have more people that you can go to or there's more a more of a direct channel for various things, whether it's a, you know, a storyline idea or legal stuff or or whatever it is. That is good, but it's also going to be something that maybe because it's coming in the midst of all this upheaval, it's going to be maybe six months to a year before this is all smooth, you know, where this is all beginning to run smoothly. And in the meantime, there could be people looking to jump ship or get out of there or more, you know, more fights or arguments or hurt feelings or whatever uh, before they can they can really get you know, iron all the kinks out of this. Well, as I I mentioned, I wanted to title the show The Self-Destruction of AEW. Mm-hmm. At a certain point, look, longtime listener will remember AEW has never exactly been my cup of tea. <laughs> but I can understand the appeal of AEW if you're just watching it kind of passively as entertainment and there have been a lot of really good wrestling matches, like the main event on dynamite this week with the death triangle guys wrestling, Will Osprey Mm -hmm. and his boys. Absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. Crazy good match. Just wild state of the art stuff. Just tremendous. Mm hmm. That being said, it feels like at a certain point, even if it was not my cup of tea, 
I could see the appeal at a certain point, or and I could understand what they were what they were doing. Right now, they have pay per view in ten or eleven days, ten days now. No main event officially announced. They are promoting an entirely different wrestling promotion at the same time. They have Ring of Honor now. The introduction of the All Atlantic Championship. The introduction of the Trios Championship. The Ring of Honor title. The Ring of Honor Pure title. The Ring of Honor Tag Team titles. The Ring of Honor Trios titles. What? Where was the point where everything got very scatterbrained? Was it the purchase of Ring of Honor? Was it Cody leaving? Was it? I feel like it feels personally to me as though there was a tipping point this year Mm -hmm. where things went off the rails. And I think it's, it's one of those two. I think it's either Tony buying Ring of Honor and further splitting his attention or Cody leaving. One of those two, I feel like, kind of made this thing almost impossible to follow and just feel like a an, an attention deficit disorder circus. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the Ring of Honor stuff, and again, it's it hasn't been as heavy on the shows post the most recent Ring of Honor pay-per-view, but there will be another one, I would assume. Probably at the end of the year, they'll do Final Battle or whatever, and that'll those elements will have to creep back into the shows. There's there's a Ring of Honor title match on Rampage this week. Sure, but like Cesaro, I mean, uh, Claudio's going to be on the show <laughs> and he happens to be the Ring of Honor champion. So that one doesn't feel like as intrusive to me sure. as like, you know, fair as, point as the Jay the Lethal. Trustbusters. Yes, the Jay Lethal or the Trustbusters or some of these folks that are clearly earmarked for... Uh, ring of honor when whenever this mythical television deal that they you know they they think they're going to get for ring of honor is a lot of these guys would theoretically go over to that show and and mostly only be on that show right um which is fine um but until then yes you do have you do have that that bleed over and then yes if ring of honor has a pay-per-view show then there's no other place for him to plug that and build up matches than on the AEW television shows. So uh, I think, and for me, it's a little bit like, I think anyone that's buying a ring of honor pay-per-view is most likely going to buy it based on the matches announced. Right. So you could probably just, you know, like, I mean, go on a rampage or a dynamite and just go, here's the card for this ring of honor show this Saturday. And people would probably you know, buy it or not buy it based on that. I don't think you have to do a ton of angles set up, but regardless of that, I do think that is a, that is a good point because the summer there, I think the continued influx of, of talent through the first part of this year with Keith Lee and Swerve. And a lot of those guys are very good. And I understand why you want them in your company, but the roster was not, you know, light, (laughs) before a lot of these guys came in and then yes you add all the ring of honor guys you add joe uh you add the claudio you add you add all of these people it's that feels like that was that was the symptom and yeah i i do think cody leading he was clearly a a guy who again had his <laughs> had his detractors in AEW and who a lot of people look to as the guy as the leader as the you know maybe the the real boss in some ways for them and when he left there was a probably a little bit of a power void and either and and without anyone kind of taking over again maybe maybe Cody was a really good sounding board for a lot of these some of these problems and and he was able to kind of filter out some of the the more combustible elements and 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 maybe that so that yeah I, I could see Cody as like a backstage personality, um, be being a part of this too because yeah there's you can look at the television shows at this time last year, and they felt you know there's always an element of of to the back and and what's coming up next and what's coming up Friday and what's coming up Monday, yes on AEW television that's always yes. that's always kind of it's been that way almost since the the first Dynamite but uh it. 
you can look at the shows a year ago when Punk was first coming in, when they were building the Hangman and Kenny and some of that stuff, where the shows were you had you had great kick ass wrestling matches, you had you know felt like you had big stars and you were building to things and you could see kind of a long term direction. Whereas you know a month ago when Moxley was the champion and nobody knew if Punk was coming back, we were looking and going what the hell's this show this biggest show of the year going to be the main event if punk's not back and then punk came back and he lost in 4 minutes and then they're doing the match again anyway and it's it's just like it just feels like there is there is despite the moving on very quickly from angles or promos or matches generally it felt i think a lot more cohesive week to week even yep. a year ago Yep. And and if you followed, you know, just one storyline, you can go from week one to week four to the pay-per-view. And if you paid attention to that storyline, again, maybe you wish there was more focus put on it or there were replays done or or recaps or video packages and things like that. But you could be satisfied with the story that was told. And generally that story ended with a very good wrestling match, which is always a bonus and should be the point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Honestly, you should. <laughs> plan on having a really good wrestling match and then book backwards from there that would be my advice to everyone that books pro wrestling um but yeah it, it, i think even even this time last year you can feel that there is less cohesion and a lot more of a wild west like 99 wcw feel to this show and i don't mean that in a good way <laughs> no no there's also we're also we also just passed the one year mark of the introduction of Rampage. So there's another mm-hmm. maybe it's not any one thing, maybe it's just a lot of dominoes fell. <laughs> sure. Yeah. The, the the introduction of Rampage, buying Ring of Honor, Cody leaving, all of these things happening. Yeah. Just looking at Cody Rose as a person and looking at the young Bucks as people mm-hmm. of those of those three guys. One stands out to me as a guy who would really like being an executive vice president. Mm -hmm. And two of the guys stand out to me as like, sure, we'll be executive vice presidents. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, like, yeah. (laughs) And Kenny, God bless Kenny. (laughs) I've known Kenny Omega for (laughs) well over a decade now. I actually don't know him, but (laughs) I saw him wrestle once. Uh, 12 years ago but mm-hmm. anyway mm-hmm. Kenny Kenny uh, I don't think he's as dumb as Kota Ibushi <laughs> <laughs> but I get similar vibes I get similar does this guy know how to read vibes mm-hmm. from Kenny Omega anyway and he's an executive vice president there so Kenny being the one to speak up and be the bad cop allegedly in that talent meeting is fascinating. And as far as contract tampering goes, look, bro, Tony Storm and William Regal both debuted in AEW on day 91 after their 90 day WWE non competes. And Storm was not explicitly advertised, but a mystery opponent that was clearly going to be Storm was advertised before her 90 days were up. So I really don't feel for AEW with the contract contract tampering thing and right. i think it's i think it's i think it's kind of bs frankly <laughs> like i'm I, I think it happens it happens in every real sport <laughs> yes. right it's like yes is the team in an official capacity reaching out to the the player that isn't technically a free agent until january 1st or whatever no no but that is, would be stupid the, right but is the star player from that team go into that guy's house and hanging out and taking him to dinner and right and giving him the hard sell of what you could expect if you come to our team right you, you're damn right he is and that's that's the same in every every real sport and it's been that way in wrestling i mean bret hart met with eric bischoff in 1995 <laughs> or whatever and and when, or 96 whenever he was gonna the deal was up before you know, before before you resigned the 20 year deal, like these things happen and they're they're always going to happen. Now, based on what happened, either the the AEW talent just thought they were being a good, honest person by, I guess, going to, right. to Tony and going, hey, they reached out to me. I don't think this is OK. 
Right. And then, and then they did some digging around and found out that they weren't the only person. Right. Or WWE was just exceptionally clumsy in a way <laughs> that any major organization that deals with these sort of talent contracts never should be. Like those are kind of the two options when it comes to the contract tampering. Right. As, yeah. yeah. As far as Kenny playing bad cop in, <laughs> in the meeting, which is very funny. My thought is just, it's like he had to, because who else was gonna. Right. Tony, the, the boss is never the bad cop, right? We know this from years of. Yep. Vince loved me, but Johnny Ace or JR or Paul Heyman or whoever, they screwed right. me over. Um, right. Yep. So Tony's not going to be the bad guy. Nope. Uh, Matt Jackson has big theater kid energy. <laughs> and I don't think he could have enough uh, of an authoritative tone. Uh, Nick Jackson is like one step above a mute. <laughs> and... Who else you got? I mean, Shivani's not going to be that guy. I mean, you could, I guess you could put JR in, in the office and have him be the guy. I don't think he could probably do it. He's got experience with that. But it's, as far as like the crew you have there, I don't think it's going to be Pat Buck or Sanjay or Tony. So right. it's going to be, it's going to be Kenny because Jericho, you know, Jericho's not an executive in the company and, you know, he could be a sounding board and, and, and all that. And punk and guys like that obviously have influence in the company. But as far as the, executives or people that are in charge it's like yeah it's gonna be kenny because there's nobody else to really fill that role it's a very good point it's you know a very it? good well, yeah one one last thing here yeah you're talking about the different factions of AEW. you know cody had a faction the elite had a faction backstage and yeah and and now punk and ftr and whoever it's like you don't hear a lot about like jericho doing much maneuvering like, like, I don't know if he's just like, he's just happy with what they give him creatively and he has a lot of say, so he's fine. Or if he's just really good at baby facing himself to everybody in that company. But like, you don't, you haven't heard a lot of like Jericho's political maneuverings over the last couple of years, which is, I think, fascinating when, you know, Punk's been there a lot less time than Jericho has and has already apparently ruffled feathers a lot more uh, aggressively. <laughs> Jericho to me, I mean, that's just never been Jericho. I mean, maybe because he was such a victim of it mm -hmm. in, in WCW. And we personally may not like Chris Jericho as a, <laughs> as a human being for various reasons. Right. But like, just as a, as a dude in the locker room, it's like, he just wants to, he clearly does some have some of that in him because like he's always got an angle going and he always has a story going mm -hmm. and he's always on TV. He's very good at attaching himself to somebody that's usually coming off of like a very hot angle or yes, someone or, that he knows can get a good match out of him at his advanced age. Yes. Or whoever's going to be a guy down the road, a jungle mm -hmm. boy early in the AEW run. Wheeler Utah here recently. Um, Garcia now. Yes. But it's like Jericho, the politician. No Jericho who wants to be a star and wants to be on television. Yes. Jericho wants to just do good stuff. Yes. I think. Yeah. So despite his personal political <laughs> leanings, I don't think that Jericho wrestling politician has ever really been much of a thing. I think he very much prides himself on being one of the boys in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that is an interesting to point. There's no Jericho click. <laughs> right. Like I'm sure there's people he hangs out with or people that go to him for like, again, for Baker and people like that have, have mentioned that Jericho is very uh, <clears throat> hands on <laughs> with their character. And, and I'm sh I'm sure he was. <laughs> uh but but uh, i'm sure he, yeah he seems like a guy who gives who's very good at giving attention like you said to up and coming acts it's just and again maybe that's his version of maneuvering it's just like hey i know this person's got a lot of talent and i want to be somebody that didn't stand in their way uh like say you know, a Bischoff or Goldberg or any of the people that he butted heads with on his way up the card or Triple H or whoever, like he, maybe he just has a very conscious, makes a very conscious effort to be a guy who's like, Hey, I can see this guy has something. I'm going to be here to 
elevate that and and be a be a part of that story in a positive way. Yep. WWE just real quick. Raw in Toronto this week. Trish Stratus was there. Uh, Kevin Owens was presented as a badass again for like the third, second or third straight week in the Triple H regime. Um, Johnny Gargano surprise return out of nowhere Mm -hmm. and Edge talked about retiring this time next year if there is a show in Toronto around this time Um, Gargano coming back in Edge uh, saying he's going to retire the two big things to me once Hunter got power I can't say I was surprised that Gargano went back to WWE Mm -hmm. the timing was surprising but maybe not when you consider that EW was in Cleveland, his hometown this week. <laughs> and maybe they really wanted to get a deal done before that show for some reason. Uh, thoughts on Gargano coming back and Edge saying that he could retire next year around this time. Yeah, I I think I think Johnny Gargano is great. And I think you'd be crazy to have a wrestling show and not want that guy. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I'm I'm happy that he's going to get a chance again. Do I think Hunter would necessarily pick this guy to push him as hard as he pushed him in NXT? Maybe not. But I think that guy will get a chance to get himself over. And if he does, he will be given opportunities <laughs> to uh, to be a main eventer and, and a top guy potentially. Or, or maybe he'll just be a, you know a solid middle of the card guy. I think I, I I think you always need a guy on a show like Gargano who he can talk, he can have great matches. He can, he's a great, great baby face. He is a, he can do like, he did a lot of comedy heel stuff his last year in NXT. So it's like, he's incredibly versatile and you can plug him in a lot of places. Like if he ever going to be your top guy for any old world champ, no, but could he feel like a, a Christian Chris Jericho type role in WWE for the next five to 10 years. I don't see why not. You could restart the DIY tag team. If you want mm-hmm. Champ- Champa, it's, I mean, it's a much better fit than Champa and Miz. Although Champa has made that work much to his, uh, <laughs> to his credit. Only thing I worry about with Gargano is it was at the point in, in the last year, year and a half of his NXT run, where he would he was really only wrestling on takeovers because he was so beat up mm-hmm. he would get hurt every time he would wrestle <laughs> and it so i worry about maybe after you know 8 or 9 months off or whatever it's been maybe he's uh doing better and um maybe putting him sticking him in a tag team could, would help with his longevity uh but i worry about a small guy like that and his longevity when he already has like a track record of getting hurt every time he wrestles. <laughs> uh, so I worry about that, but I think everything else he said is more than valid. And uh, Edge is going to retire. Oh, no, wait, please come back. <laughs> don't stop. Yeah, I I don't know. I think we've, we've talked about this a lot over the last two years or however long he's been back. And look, I think obviously the that first match he had with Randy Orton would not have been what it was <laughs> if they were did that in front of a crowd instead of in an empty gymnasium uh so i i don't hold that against him other than that they decided to go 48 minutes or whatever <laughs> yeah i hold that against him but also since he's been back in front of a crowd uh he has had no good matches <laughs> um at least none that are like memorably good in my uh in my estimation so it's tough for me. Like, I think it's, I'm very happy that he got to come back because, you know, off, off, off screen, off the, uh, the fictional raw and, uh, or SmackDown that he's on. Adam Copeland seems like a real good dude, <laughs> or at least like for the last 10 years or so, he's been a really good dude. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy that he's found, that he got to come back and and rewrite his final chapter on his terms and all that. I think that's wonderful. But as far as like, will I be sad to see edge the weekly television character go? No. Cause to me, he feels like a tribute act <laughs> to rest to a wrestling. We talked about that. I think with the elite last week, it's like he feels like a tribute act to a version of pro wrestling that doesn't exist anymore. And I think he's just, not uh not a character i and i think again 
if he wants to leave, he wants to retire, quote unquote, and then come back and wrestle a couple more times once and he's on the show once a year. Great. Happy, happy for him that he gets to do that if he wants to do that. But full time wrestling character edge has, I think, for the most part, been a a swing and a miss. So, you know, they're going to I guess the hint was there that maybe they're doing SummerSlam in Toronto next year. So it sounds like it sounds like it. So if that's the case, he can have his retirement match and I'm sure it'll be very emotional and everything, but uh, it won't uh, it won't break my heart either. Same, same. I went from never seeing a bad edge match to now seeing a lot of bad edge matches. <laughs> and it's I what I have been thinking, like, how is this going to end? You know, like, right. And and maybe he sees the writing on the wall with Triple H being in charge now and Triple H uh-huh. never being an edge guy. Um, Yeah, maybe that's part of it, too. Maybe he just realized, OK, well, it's time. And maybe he he physically just knows, OK, it's it, it's time. Let me write my own ending. Good for him. Good for him. I yeah. like Edge and Beth as Edge and Beth as people, Um, even if Edge, the wrestling character, is not something. I need to see anymore. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's fair. All right. Anything else? Only thing I would say is as, as we continue into this new era of WWE, where we, we put more of a focus on in ring uh, wrestling. Yeah. It would be good if these longer matches between top stars, um, if there was something they were wrestling for like a belt, perhaps. Sure. Uh, And Roman gave an, another interview this week with Sports Illustrated where he re- reaffirmed that he will not be around very much. So, uh, yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe it's time to, uh, to get those belts, get those belts off him or split the belts again and just <laughs> have him vacate one that the, the people that are having all these wrestling matches on television all the time can wrestle for. And then he can come back and defend the other one six times a year and, and the Saudi shows. Yeah. It very it, it does very much feel like that, but there's been a directive in the last couple of weeks with Triple H that, okay, we're just gonna rip the bandaid off and we're gonna go from having two minute matches to twenty minute matches mm-hmm. <laughs> on Raw, and there's not gonna be a period where we reeducate the audience slowly. It's just we're ripping the bandaid off and we're doing a long match every time out now. Mm-hmm. I I don't I don't necessarily hate it. I just think it's it's interesting the way that they just decided, okay, well, we're just going to do this. Because <laughs> usually there's a period where they slowly try to re-educate the audience. And it's like, mm-hmm. no, this time they're just ripping the Band-Aid off. Yep, every, <laughs> pretty much everybody's going going 20 now. Uh, you know, going minimum two segments, if not three. Uh, so yeah, like, and I think that's fine if there is something on the line or something that uh, <laughs> they're, you know, the winner... <laughs> Perhaps I'm I'm not suggesting rankings because I think we've Ugh. I mean AEW doesn't do it, UFC doesn't do it well. WWE tried it for like two weeks a, a couple of years ago and they gave up. I'm not suggesting rankings, but it's just something where you know a winner can maybe move on and, and challenge for a belt that might be. And I know they have at least in this first month tried to uh like they're doing the video packages about the the U S and intercontinental championship. So maybe he has an idea of like, well, Roman can keep the world titles in perpetuity and, and we're going to try to make the, which is what they've always said they were going to do when the world champion is only on one show or not on any shows for a while. So we'll, we can, we can elevate the IC belt and that'll become the, you know, the world title on, on regular TV. And then the, the real world champion will just come in for the big event. So it's like, you could, you could try that, but that's something you will need like maybe a year or more of, you talk about like re-educating your audience to care about the U.S. title at this point, or the or the Intercontinental title. Yep. All right. So next time, everybody, I'm Ethan, and I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Adios. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features.
So you managed to go to an Oreo game where they lost. That's mm-hmm. difficult. That's difficult to do. Yeah, it's the first time it's happened to be this year. I mean, I've only been to, that was only I think my third game I've been to this year. But yeah, yeah. it was it was like one of those things where, like to date, the Lopez trade hasn't really felt like it hurt that much. But the last night it did. When you look around and you go, "All right, they're not using Batista, and they can't, and they don't want to throw Tate back out there." Mm-hmm. And what do we got else? So it's it's Baker, it's Vespi, it's yeah, uh, Luis Head <laughs> or Heed. Yes. Uh, it's like okay, yeah. The, there is that thing where when you trade away your ninth inning guy and everybody shifts backwards, all of a sudden your fifth and sixth inning guys are pitching the seventh and eighth at least a couple nights a week. Yeah, Brian Baker. I mean. He's Mariano Rivera compared to Evan Phillips <laughs> and Travis Lakin Sr. and guys of that ilk. Mm-hmm. But yes, doesn't really inspire confidence when you see Brian Baker's coming into the game. Yeah, I mean, I mean, particularly in last night's case, it was just they, they gave up 12 hits and they were all singles. Like they. <laughs> yeah. And, yep. and there was a couple walks in there too, but it's like they didn't. Uh not like they were giving up a ton of ton of bombs or anything they just it's just a lot of balls squeaking through you know there's a yes. couple of plays where you're like hey if someone besides Rudinetto Dorb was playing second base maybe that's a <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's not a hit but you know it's worth it for that once every three weeks where he hits a a, a majestic <laughs> bomb yes no one hits no one hits a more majestic bomb I gotta give them that most swagger a negative war <laughs> player has ever had, but you don't feel like it's unearned somehow. <laughs> right. Yes. It's a guy you want on your team. <laughs> Maybe you want him playing once a week instead of six times a week, but mm-hmm. you want him on your team. Yeah. I try to keep on keeping on. <laughs>